Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to get started. Ladies and gentlemen, George Widom. Now, if your tool actually has a normalized function that lets you set the levels to that value of minus 24, then you have an advantage. I can hit normalize, choose normalize to luffs, and type in minus 24. Whoops, minus 24. And take all the guesswork out of it. There you go. Now my audio is set to a, a luffs of minus 24 dB. It's easy with short bits of audio, but with longer bits of audio, where there's a lot of dynamic range, it can be harder. So how can we change the dynamic range? Well, we can do that by using compression or dynamics tools. So that leads me to my next question. This one came from Robert Leach, and he says, George, can you give a demonstration of how to set the AU Dynamics processor? This is a plug-in that comes on every single Mac, which is audio units compatible, or it's an audio units plug-in. So it's, it's a tool that I, have to, that I use by setting by ear. I don't use this as a way to achieve a measurement as much as I use by tuning sound by ear, but I can show you visually and orally or audibly what it would, how it changes. So if I go to effect stacks, I'm sorry, audio units, go to your flat list and you'll find AU Dynamics Processor, you'll get this window here. There's two sets of controls, or actually there's four sets of controls in the Dynamics Processor that are visible at first. There's also details under the Attack, Release, and Master Gain settings too. Just as a, a starting point, you can pretty much guarantee you'll have good results if you set your Attack, Release, and Master Gain as I have them here. So don't worry too much about twiddling with those. Usually a very fast attack a little bit slower release, and no change of gain works well. But in Dynamics Processor, we've got two parts. We have the gate or downward expander part, which I'm not gonna talk about right now, but we also have the compression side, and that's what more affects what kind of recording dynamics we actually end up having. And by playing this audio back in a loop, I'll let you watch the little red arrow and see what it does as it travels up the scale and gets into the compression range. So I'll take my downward expander gate ratio and just slide it all the way over to the left to one so it's disabled. And let's just look at what happens when I control my dynamics with the sliders. That's more than 21 hybrids. Seriously. The Fiesta gets 40 highway miles per gallon. That's more than 21 hybrids. Seriously. The Fiesta gets 40 highway miles per gallon. That's more than 21 hybrids. Seriously. So as I lower this control here, that's the threshold. As the threshold drops down, you get more and more compression to the audio. While hearing it might be challenging, by setting these settings and seeing how they result on the waveform, you can kind of learn a little bit more about what they're doing. So if I click apply and look at the waveform, look at how the dynamic range in the waveform has been almost completely removed or mostly completely removed. The difference between the quiet and the loud sections before, there were sections that were as low as that point there and as high as this point here. After I add the compression, the difference between the quietest section and the loudest section is much, much closer. And that's because I reduced, reduced dynamic range. But you're thinking, wait a minute, it got quieter. How would that actually help me bring up the volume? Well, that's because now we can make up the volume later by using normalize. But they don't, as tying back into the LUFS measurement, using too much compression allows us to bring up our levels much too high. So if I was to take that recording and normalize it to minus three, if I wasn't using the LUFS normalize, but the peak normalize, which is what most people use, we'd be sending out an audio sample that sounds like this. 21 hybrids, seriously. The Fiesta gets 40 highway miles per gallon. And basically, while that sounds very uh, loud and in your face, what they're saying is that it's too loud and it could be perceived as over-processed. And if we take a look now, our LUFS is minus 16 dB. So remember when we started before processing, our LUFS or average, average levels 
was at minus 20. And now that we've added the processing and normalized, it's now minus 16. We've actually raised the average volume by using compression and then normalizing to make up the difference. So you got to use this stuff carefully and not over compress. How do you know if you're over compressing? Well, a lot of it is using your ear. Um, other than looking at Luff's numbers, they're nice as a guideline, but I never use a number to judge the way something should sound. I always use my ear. And by that, I'm going to usually find a threshold somewhere between minus 23 and minus 20 works pretty well. That's assuming you've normalized your audio before you process it to minus 3 dB. And uh, the headroom control, this is where we can get really, comp really, really heavy limiting compression. By that, I mean as the volume drops or, or raises past the, th the threshold, it's not allowed to get any louder. And that means the headroom is almost totally gone. Headroom is how far the volume can rise before it is chopped off. So if I set the headroom to minus three and the threshold to minus 21, all right, so threshold minus 21, headroom six. Let's see what happens. Check the results. We have an average luffs of minus 23 dB. But does it sound good? That's really what matters. Let's find out. That's more than 21 hybrids. Seriously. When it's too compressed, it just sounds like the person is too close to you. They're too in your face. It's like they're yelling in your ear. And you got to really watch out for that. So using these compression tools are really th things that have to be tuned by ear. But if you're trying to achieve a certain average RMS, they can also be used to help uh, tune your settings to reach those specifications. Well, that takes me to my last question. Howard Ellison asked about using compression as well. Some people call it a black art, and I wondered if you would throw some light on it, particularly for keeping voice audible above music. I'm not here to teach how to produce music, produce uh, voiceover tracks for a final mix. That's a whole nother skill set that's called producing. And I've got, I've dabbled in it and I've done a lot of music mixing, so I kind of know how it works. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how to mix for music or how to mix a final product. But really, the reason why we use the compression at all is to do one of or probably two things one to raise the average volume or the luffs up to a certain percentage or certain setting that satisfy, satisfies the client's needs and satisfies a standard that was being is starting to be uh, set in the industry and the other thing we're going to use dynamics mostly for is to take control over certain syllables or or uh, mouth sounds or words that jump out louder than others. So looking at this sample here. The Fiesta gets 40 highway miles per gallon. That's more than 21 hybrids. Notice how when she says, that's more than 21 hybrids. That's, that's more than, really is quite a bit louder than. The Fiesta gets 40. So this middle of the sentence, which isn't even the name of the product, is louder than the name of the product. The Fiesta gets 40. So that's one way we're squashing the peaks, as Howard refers to here. That's one way we can get control over those changes in dynamics. So I'll usually use a headroom of somewhere between 18 and 20 dB. And let's see what kind of a change that makes. So I'm going to click apply. Now look at how this section here and this section here are a lot closer in volume to each other. The Fiesta gets 40 highway miles per gallon. That's more than 21 hybrids. Seriously. It's a subtle change, but when you're listening to it mixed over music or anything else, that keeps the volume of the voice up loud enough, especially after it's been brought up higher in the mix, so that it can float above the music, and it keeps louder and quieter sections from being too far off and distance from each other in volume. The better the voice actor or the more years of practice you have, the better you are at keeping consistent volume all the way through the read. Less experienced readers will tend to have larger changes in volume from beginning to end. That's where the compression tool can come in. So if you want to get more detail on how to compress your audio, that's going to be something you're going to want to work with me one-on-one -on -one over. I can teach you how to use the tools. Everybody's compression system is different. Everybody's plugins are different. They all translate differently. So I'd be happy to teach you one-on-one. -on -one. I also do uh, tutorials from time to time on how to use specific tools. So. 
If you have a specific tool you'd like to have a tutorial on, drop me a line. Any questions, anything at all you want to know about, send them in to widomsworld at edgestudio.com. Well, I hope I didn't make your eyes roll too far into the back of your head today. Thanks for listening. My name's George Widom, and this has been Widom's World. I'll talk to you guys next week. See you later.